Welcome one and all to Last Stop Penn Station podcast featuring Carrie Silken and Ian Riccoboni. They dive deep into Carrie's wealth of stories and no subject is off limits. From the world of wrestling to his ticket agency, growing up in New Jersey, drug-fueled underground days, hustling in the French Quarter of New Orleans, and endless days and nights in New York City, every story is worth telling. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Last Stop Penn Station. Ian Riccoboni and our guest of honor, Carrie Silken. Carrie, what a week we had last week. It was kind of a laugh fest. <laughs> it was a laugh fest. And my goal, I don't think I'll ever be able to recreate that again, <laughs> to have you in a fit of laughter, which is extremely infectious. And thus, it makes me laugh. And then you laugh more. I don't have... You know, in my in my uh, bag of tricks, I don't have many Chester O'Sullivan <laughs> or Willie Gilsenberg stories. <laughs> yeah, there's not much. I went home and I looked up Willie Gilsenberg. There's not even much out there on Willie Gilsenberg. So it's nice for the the fans of the old school WWWF to know a little bit more about the great illustrious history of the former president. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> As I referenced last week, you know, my parents knew him or met him and all the Newark Jewish people. It was a tight knit community. And his partner was a guy named Babe Cullen. And they were had been promoting boxing, wrestling, probably some concerts, mm -hmm. uh, roller derby, circuses at the old Newark Armory. <laughs> Matter of fact, it, my father claimed that, you know, this is like, so the first time I ever saw wrestling live was at Sunnyside Gardens, which I think, think we've talked about. Mm -hmm. But before that, you know, I was like 11. So before that, when I first started watching wrestling in uh, 1966, the ads, the ads would come on during the wrestling show. So boys and girls listening out there when wrestling played in your town like we'll, we'll talk wwwf if you lived in boston or the massachusetts area the same tape that played in the new jersey new york area in the new jersey new york area they'd say Ooh, coming to the air-conditioned Atlantic City. Ooh, the cool ocean breezes are a blowing. It would be, it would be March, you know? right. and, or, or they'd say, uh, Patterson, New Jersey, get ready. And, or if you were in the, if you were in Boston, uh, the Massachusetts area, certainly would be talking about the Boston Gardens, but they would be talking about. You know, ooh, coming to Worcester or coming to Providence, Rhode Island or these other little towns. So for me, being a Cranford kid and my dad's sister, Mike, Mike G and his mom and my aunt Debbie lived on the hillside Newark border. And my father owned a bar in Newark, which he sold uh in, I was like seven or eight, but I just thought, well, we're close to Newark. So I heard the ad coming into the Newark Armory. <laughs> <laughs> now, at this period of time, they had had the 64. There was a lot of uh, just like what's going on now. There was a lot of racial tension mm -hmm. and, you know, the riots in Newark. So when I said to my father, oh, Dad, can we go to the Newark Armory? Bruno Sumortino's going to be there. <laughs> He's like, are you crazy? And in further discussions with him, he told me the place is no good. It no, he goes, it's a big, he goes, I, I'm not taking there. He goes, it's, it's not a good neighborhood. It was never in a good neighborhood. He goes, as a matter of fact, him and his friend Frankie went there. He didn't like wrestling. Like, you know, <laughs> it, during the like late forties, well, maybe the, it, maybe when the neighborhood was half decent. And he said, when the fans, when the fans would get, when the fans would get upset at a decision, 
and at the boxing match, they would, <laughs> <laughs> they would throw plates of spaghetti. <laughs> Why would they be eating spaghetti? <laughs> Where did they get it? Like you go to the you go to the <laughs> you go to the uh, the, the snack stand to get a soda or a beer and a hot dog. Oh, can I get a plate of spaghetti, please? <laughs> Light on the sauce. <laughs> I, oh, I thought the, I, oh, I thought they, the the euf, I thought there was a racial euphemism of the neighborhoods no, changed, but they was, li- they literally meant there was no more spaghetti. Maybe maybe it was an Italian neighborhood back in the late forties. The young Newark was a melting pot, right? So I, so I remember, you know, my father had two sisters when he, when that I met me live. He had Aunt Debbie, who was very demure. You know, they, they were brought up in the Depression. They were money, but uh, they did okay for themselves, but they got out of that. But she was very demure. And she she used to like to read. And um, she wasn't really cultured, but she was a lady. Then you had my Aunt Betty. And Aunt Betty was like, you know, bawdy. She'd <laughs> curse and she liked wrestling too. Nice. And uh, De- so De- Debbie and Betty were were complete antithesis of each. Is that the right word mm-hmm. of each other? And um, I think maybe my father was telling the story about the spaghetti. Like like Betty would say, "Oh, Philly, they didn't have any goddamn spaghetti." <laughs> <laughs> There's a classic tape I have. <laughs> Uh, it's a cassette. I got. I got to give it to someone like AJ or maybe you. That might. <laughs> it's my parents, Uncle Gunny. No, oh, wait a minute. It's Betty, my parents, Frankie that owned the record store, okay. which we've spoken about. Where he, when he <laughs> moved from Newark to Montclair, there was the porn store right next to him, <laughs> which I'd sneak in at like <laughs> the age of seventeen. Anyway, so they, they were planning. Gunny and Debbie. Gunny was married to Debbie, the demure woman. Oh. So they were planning um, Debbie and Gunny's 40th birthday anniversary. So they were trying to make a guest list. <laughs> so it's, my, it's, it's Betty and her husband, Nat, who owned a shoe store. He was a classic. Uh, he, he used to specialize. Nat would specialize in going to these shoe shoe auctions so in other words he would go to, to these shoe auctions and there was only women's shoes hmm. and they would have like <laughs> a thousand pairs <laughs> different <laughs> you know they might have uh, the same style but it was only in a size six nine and <laughs> so he'd buy shoes at like this is kind of what Marshalls does or TJ Maxx now like, but back then, wow, this is fascinating. And he it? would buy like a thousand pairs for, oh, a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. And then he'd, he, the, the shoe store was in Point Pleasant Beach. Oh, I've, then, been, I've been to Point Pleasant <laughs> a few times. Yeah. <laughs> and he would sell them. You know, it was, this is, this is in, I remember going down there like in the early seventies and uh, he would sell them for like six, seven bucks. A woman would come in and she liked a particular style. Well, she was a size eight. And I remember going in the back. I'd be in the back. He had an adding machine. I used to punch the buttons and hit the, <laughs> right? It, it, it had the good sound, um, similar to a pinball machine. But so I'd be, I'd say, hey, Uncle Nat, do, do you have that lady size? He goes, doesn't matter. I go, what do you mean it doesn't matter? And he would go out with two boxes. Let's say she was a size eight. Um, <laughs> he'd go out with a six and a half. He goes, oh, shit, I got a six. I hear him, oh, six and a half, all right. And then he goes, <laughs> then, he, then he's like, then he finds one. He goes, oh, man, God damn it. The only other one, oh, nine and a half, all right. He'll take the two boxes out and he'll put the nine and a half in the ladies swimming. It's like, man, they'll shriek. <laughs> he'll put the shit, no, I can't use those. He'll pull the six and a halves out and he'll take a shoehorn. You know, like that shoe stretcher? Yeah. Have you ever seen, I'm I have. not talking about a horn. It's yeah. Like, 
the street. Right. Yeah, yeah. So he tried to. They were close, but anyway, Betty and Nat, my mother, my father, and their friend Frankie, the five of them, and I was looking at the Playboy magazines <laughs> at Uncle Nat's house. <laughs> so they're trying to make this guest list for Debbie and Gunny's 40th anniversary. And they're going the names of family and friends. <laughs> and I remember Frankie, who was like not a member of the family, but he'd been around with these people for 30, 40 years. He's like, hey, yo. Uh, I think you forgot Cy Gold, Cy and Cy and Reba Goldberg, and Frank, Betty, the body hand goes, oh, Jesus Christ, Frankie, they've both been dead for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so with Newark, my dad didn't want to bring me to Newark. Oh. Wouldn't allow me to go to Newark, but um, yeah. <laughs> This is this is a question. So, when they would spool the tapes and they would they would wheel or spool wheel, there's a couple different ways. Bicycle, bicycle. So yep. Yeah. There's a, a when the tapes I'm familiar with have Howard Finkel, and it would be Vince McMahon saying, "Well, we're at a great matchup here between Iron Mike Sharp and B. Brian Blair." And then it would there'd be an awkward pause, and it would be Howard Finkel. Coming to the Allentown Fairgrounds, coming up on May 5th, and then be a quick, you'll see Bob Backlund and take out Gravy Hammer Valentine. Do you remember who that was in the 70s? No idea. No? Okay. It was, a, it was a generic voice. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate that a lot of the TV stuff for all the territories was taped over. Yeah. There is some existing 60s WWF TV, and it must... How it survived, I don't know, but it's on YouTube and uh, you hear the ads mm. on that. But who did it? Maybe it was Willie Gilson. <laughs> Could be. Well, this is an excellent segue. I know we normally talk about the Ring of Honor Pure Tournament. We had two great matches this week. We know the finalists now. Yes. Tracy Williams and Jonathan Gresham. You know, you got to people that are listening to us. I assume most of them are wrestling fans. And hopefully we've picked up some other people because of these crazy stories and these characters um but you got to check out the roh product that's out now it's so good um this past week with the tracy williams jay lethal match and the jonathan gresham against josh the goods woods yeah two excellent matches not to mention that wild brawl with uh vincent and uh, Matt Taven. Yeah, I think that's. I think we haven't seen the last of those two, and uh, they're really pushing each other's buttons right now. And that's it's such a stark contrast. You know, I think fans are desensitized in a way to when something gets violent like that. But the pure tournament against the backdrop of that, you know, we're seeing we're seeing the different flavors of ice cream, and they're not melting together. You get a very nice variety. Well, every Monday there's a Ring of Honor watch party. You could watch the show on the Ring of Honor website at no cost. You know, mm -hmm. we'd love you to join Honor Club, mm -hmm. but you can watch it at no cost and interact with the stars of Ring, Ar Ring of Honor on Twitter. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the new material. I spoke to our good friend, Ring announcer Bobby Cruz, Double B. Double B, yeah. And... Uh, he never well, you know him. He don't sugarcoat or bullshit about anything. No. I asked him how was the how were the matches. He goes, yeah. it was very he, very good. Yeah. We're talking about the taping of a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and those will start in two weeks. This week is going to be Gresham versus Williams, and uh, we'll crown the first pure champion in fourteen years. Awesome. Which is just about how long Bruno San Martino held the WWF championship. The first time was about seven years. The second go round was was about three or yes. four. And uh, that's who what today's episode's on. And, you know, Bruno, you mentioned uh, you mentioned New York. You mentioned Sunnyside Gardens. And you've mentioned in the past that Bruno was kind of your first favorite. He was. Um, I, I would safe to say, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm safe. I think I would like to think anyone listening, even our producer, AJ, would know who Bruno San Martino is. But it's possible people don't. He was he was one of the Babe Ruths of pro wrestling. 
it certainly was the Babe Ruth of pro wrestling in the Northeast. Uh, he was he was a celebrity, and uh, he was. Can I say he was a household name? I think on the East Coast. I think you know that was a time when the Dumont Network. It was short. It was about eight years after the Dumont Network that ceased to exist, where wrestling was the high, highest rated program on television, and it kind of came and and, and went as quickly as it came. Uh, but you had Gorgeous George, and you had broadcasts from Chicago and L.A. and New York. Um, after that, it kind of got re-regionalized. Mm-hmm. They kind of burnt out on wrestling. And that's when you saw Bruno kind of go from Pittsburgh and uh, those early Pittsburgh, not outlaw territories, but they weren't quite WWF yet. And come to, you know, wrestle in Toronto. He, well, yeah. he was he was actually banned for a while. Mm-hmm. Did you know that? I, blackballed. Yeah. yeah. Um, the details you'll have to get from someone else, but he... I think he he did a, he took a booking a double not a double booking but he worked somewhere that Vince McMahon Senior wasn't crazy about mm-hmm. and they didn't want him around he had a, he almost quit the business he went to Toronto mm-hmm. and he wrestled in Toronto and they billed him as the Italian he, he wasn't a superstar yet they mm-hmm. billed him as an Italian strongman and it was a big Italian population and he got over big this is before my time. And uh, Vince McMahon brought him back. Vince McMahon Sr. brought him back to New York. And he won the championship from Buddy Rogers in 63. So when I started watching wrestling in the dim and distant past of 1960, you know, like, meanwhile, back in the year of one. (laughs) It's 1966. But that's when I started watching wrestling. So here's the thing. Uh, you would always hear Bruno's name and Bruno would be in Washington, D.C. where the matches were taped because he had to do the interviews. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't use him on TV except in rare occasions. They wanted to make you come to the arena and buy tickets. All the matches were squash matches where you saw some great hero against some not so great enhancement talent very rarely would they give you a competitive match hardly ever mm-hmm. this you know this is the 60s uh because they wanted you to come out whether it was to elizabeth new jersey or to this to the uh catholic youth center in scranton, scranton. Yeah. or in harrisburg or at ag hall in allentown or the Trenton, beautiful Trenton Armory. <laughs> right. They wanted you to come there and buy the tickets to see the big stars go against each other. Mm-hmm. Many of them are surrounding us here. Right. But uh, so I knew that Bruno was special. And I was buying the wrestling magazines. I was going to ask, how did, you, how did you first see him? Was it a magazine or... Um, I saw him being interviewed. Okay. And he's huge. He was huge up until the day he passed away. Right. And his, his interviews were, were compelling and he would always end the interview speaking in Italian. Let me speak at Ray Morgan. The announcer would go, Bruno, can you say a few words to, to your Italian speaking friends? It was probably a carryover from Antonina Rocca. Right. Who Antonina Rocca, was he Italian? <laughs> was he Spanish? <laughs> Uh, he appealed to to both segments of that. Right. So you'd see Bruno get interviewed. They brought in, it wasn't really his cousin, but it was uh, Antonio Pagazzi. Okay. Tony Parisi, he also rest, wrestled right. under. And it was Bruno's cousin. And the first time I remember seeing Bruno on TV, there was supposed to be a tag, they were supposed to have a tag team match with... Um, Oh, who knows? Like Luke Graham and Tarzan Tyler against Antonio Pagazzi and Bruno. Wow. And Ray Morgan. And, you know, wrestling was on at nine o'clock for a period of time. It's Saturday night. But, you know, I was 10 years old. My mom, they would let me stay up. uh, So I was so excited. I'm going to get to see Bruno. And Ray Morgan makes an announcement. You know, ladies and gentlemen, Bruno's flying in from uh, you know, probably like he would say from Tokyo, right. Right? Or Rio de Janeiro. Yeah. That was always, and he might not get her. So the match starts, and I'm like, oh man, no. Bruno's flying. <laughs> so 
it's who 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 would you think they would have a team with Ant, uh, Antonio Pagazzi? Oh, it's a very obvious answer. Oh, off the top of my head, uh, who's, for, who's was associated with Bruno? Oh, Tony Altamori? No. Nah. Too late. When I tell you, you're going to go, of I, course. Uh, the golden boy, Arnold Scullin. Oh, duh. Right. Yeah. It was Bruno's manager, right. as well as Bob Backlund's manager. Right. So Arnold Scullin's in the ring, and they're wrestling They're wrestling these guys, and some dirty deed happens, and uh, Scullin is, uh, can't wrestle, and they're beating up on Bruno's cousin, and all of a sudden, Bruno comes running down the aisle with suitcase in hand. <laughs> he, he got there in such a haste that he would Didn't. not even put his suitcase in the dressing room. Amazing. And he ran, you know, a couple of suitcase hits and uh, the, 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 the bad guys scattered. Yeah. And that was the first time. Then they moved the wrestling from... How did this go? Because they moved it to like an off night, like a, it was a school night, hmm. uh, like a, a Tuesday night, or and, and they announced it. Bruno San Martino is going to be wrestling against the Beast. The Beast was from Canada. Hmm. Um, I should know his name. Uh, some someone some it, he wrestled all over the place. But anyway, my mom is saying you got to go to bed. Okay. You know, I didn't have a TV in my room at the time yet. Mm -hmm. And she hated wrestling. <laughs> you know, that, she, that was garbage. So, I, but, but mom, Bruno's going to wrestle the beast. <laughs> she didn't care. No. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was um, a bummer. Eventually, he was on TV at some point. And, um, you, you know, I, when I started going, when I went to that Sunnyside Garden show... When I went to my first few wrestling shows locally, um, Bruno was not on the card. And by the time I started going to Madison Square Garden, which was 71, that's when Pedro Morales had taken over the championship. Mm -hmm. You know, Bruno lost to Ivan. Oh, here's a good one. Um, Bruno had the belt for seven years. And the only way you could find out about what happened the night before at Madison Square Garden was the Daily News or even the New York Times mm -hmm. would have a little tiny <laughs> blurb in the sports section. It's about just that big. <laughs> well, I come on Tuesday uh, after the uh, 71 January Ivan Koloff match. I come downstairs to breakfast and my father had the papers because he tended bar and he brought the papers, you know. Oh. And the, I remember sitting there looking in the sports section and I, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> uh, Koloff beats Bruno, wins title. Wow. Now, there was other guys that would win. There was a disqualification win. Right. But, uh, and I was like, I was stunned because you just never thought he would lose. Yeah. And uh, I probably knew... Uh, Things weren't completely on the up and up. But at that point in time, I was uh, 13, 14 years old. I, I got it. But uh, Bruno losing was shocking. It, it, our good friend Bill Apter tells a story. He was taking photos that night, and he was in the Madison Square Garden, and he said that was the quietest building he's ever been in when Ivan Koloff hit the knee and, and pinned Bruno. Right. And it was it, a sh Complete shocker. I don't know if George Knapp was there, but uh, they were worried about, you know, getting Koloff out of there. But the, it, the fans were in a state of shock. Yeah. The other title changes when Morales lost, it was in Philly. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what happened. I don't even know if there's footage of it. He lost to Stan Stasiak. He did. I don't I've never seen it. If it exists, it might not exist. And then Bruno lost the second time. To Billy Graham in Baltimore, oh, right? right. Yeah. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Right. I wonder if Gary Juster was at that. Right. I've never asked him. I've never asked him. I, our, our good friend Kevin Eck was at a couple of those cards. Not at that one though. Okay. Yeah. yeah Kevin went to all the Baltimore shows, most mm -hmm. of them. So Kevin's what, like fifty-three or something? Yeah, I think he would have been. He would have got age. a ride. Yeah. 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 But when I so when I started going to the Garden every month with my cousin. 
in 72, 73, uh, we would finally get to see Bruno. He would come in once in a blue moon, you know, and then he started coming. When, when they asked him to come back, it was he was only supposed to be champion for a year. And Vince McMahon Sr., it was a, a verbal deal. You know, look, business is down. Pedro Morales is drawing in New York and Philly, but he's really not drawing in some of these other places. So would you come back? And Bruno's like, hey, Lamb Chop. Hey. It's <laughs> <laughs> a, a good sound to hear. We yeah. talked about Lamb Chop being on the men last week. <laughs> yeah, she's on the men. She wants to be on the She's like, well, I want to be on the show too. <laughs> so... Um, Pedro wasn't drawing the way they liked to. Bruno said he'd come back for a year, and a year became three years. Mm -hmm. And that's when I um, that's when I used to see him often. And I saw him in matches against Killer Kowalski, mm -hmm. Don Leo Jonathan, Don Jardine the Spoiler. Wow. Um, Did he have the mask, or was the mask still outlawed? He didn't use the mask. Yeah. He, it yeah. was outlawed, and he yeah. I guess he was getting a really good payday. Yeah. Well, maybe we should, some of the listeners don't know that. For a, a long time, mask wrestlers and, and women wrestlers. Were, and uh, gimmick, cage or chain matches. Right. Were, they weren't allowed either. And the, in, was that, that, I'm assuming that was an athletic was, commission decision. Yes. The Athletic Commission lifted it in 74. But mm -hmm. I saw these great guys, including uh, Nikolai Volkov, who was very good right. in, in that era. Ernie Ladd. The big cat. Right. George the Animal Steel. Yeah. I, he would always wrestle. <clears throat> I didn't know it at the time. But being a school teacher in Michigan, mm -hmm. you know this, right? I do, yeah. He really just wrestled in the summer. Can you <laughs> Can you imagine that going to school? Hey, you look familiar. No, not, eh, I get that a lot. <laughs> yeah. The, so I saw George Steele and uh, as well as names like Baron Von Rasky, who came in for not, he came in for just a program with Bruno. Mm -hmm. It was the, uh, the big guy of the month club. If a, if a guy was, if they drew money, there'd be two matches if they didn't draw money, there'd only be one and done. But if it yeah. was really good, they would do three. Right. And of course, the rematch with Ivan Koloff. When right. when Bruno uh, got his revenge on Koloff, and I, I was there in 75, and they, they did two two matches, and the blow-off match was a steel cage match. It's on, uh, certainly on the YouTube, if not the network, mm. and... Uh, I remember being at that, and and Bruno just made mincemeat of him. Uh, it was like a really a it's pretty it's, it's pretty brutal. But I, I was more shocked that uh, they didn't give Kolov had like very little offense. It was a true it was a true revenge. Um, besides the aforementioned names, Waldo von Eric came in. Bugsy McGraw came in. That's not a name you hear in WWF too often, Bugsy McGraw. He was more of a, a Southern Texas guy. He was. And when he came to the garden, <clears throat> tickets weren't selling oh. against Bruno. Yeah. So what did they do? He was managed by Lou Albano. Mm. So at the last minute, they announced, you know, they did something on TV where they jumped Bruno, him and Albano. So they made it a handicap match because people wanted to see Albano get his uh, ass kicked. And uh, the other, oh, Spiros Arion. Right. He was a really good opponent. Yeah, he turned his back on Bruno, right? Yes. Yeah, the Golden Greek. Yes, it, he was a great opponent. They, those matches, see, if, if people watch these matches now, they're going to say they're too slow, there's no action. But for the time, it worked. Mm -hmm. There was no lighting except the ring lights. There was no music, but when these guys came out, you know, when Bruno would come out, you know, the, the place would rumble. The opposite of when he lost, when it was right. like dead silence, the place would rumble. And uh, he had a great sense. You know, they always wrestlers, they, they always talk. I mean, at the Ring of Honor seminars. Uh, one of the or any good wrestling seminar, they're always talking about, you know, you got to listen to the crowd, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be a good wrestler. You got to have good ears and listen because it's so important to for the timing of of what to do. And some people say, well, Bruno was just a punch and kick guy. And 
He, you know, he wasn't a great wrestler, but he was a great worker and his sense of timing. There's one match. I tried finding it. They washed it off YouTube. It's, and I saw it live, him against Killer Kowalski in 73, 73 after he got the belt back. And uh, the way Hulk Hogan used to do, you know, the Hulk up. Yeah. The, uh, well, Bruno, Kowalski gets, is, is, is getting all this heat on him. He's beating the crap out of him. Uh, of course, there's blood. And when Bruno makes the comeback, you know, he just was like, look up. Chin up, look up look to the up sky. Look up to the Italian guys. Yeah, right. And you hear the place rumbling. Yeah. And when he finally comes in with the first punch, it would be like the lights went out at the Rolling Stones and they're ready to come on. Yeah. It was that, it was that kind of energy. So I was there for all those shows. Uh what was it about Bruno that that connected? Because I have my own reasons, and I'm I'm a person that never saw him wrestle contemporaneously, and he, he connected with me. But I'm curious to hear what drew you to him. It, you, you, well, they 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 sold him right. Uh, so when I started watching, he already had the title for four year, three and a half years. His interviews were, you know, he would never like, he would only get angry once in a while mm -hmm. in the interview or, or, you know, raise his voice. And uh, his, uh, you know, the charisma live, uh, it was like a, uh, uh, you know, one plus one equals three. Yeah. You know, it just. Uh, what is that? A symbiotic, uh, <laughs> asymmetric. Uh, yeah. uh, it was just a special, a special thing happened. Yeah. And, um, you know, he had, it. how about that? Sure. He, he always seemed honest, sincere. He seemed like you could trust him. Uh, he seemed like he, and this is weird cause I've never, like I've seen him wrestle, but I didn't watch him in the sixties, obviously or the seventies. Uh, you, you just always, it seemed like you could count on him and that's a weird quality, but same thing with Hulk Hogan. When you hear Hulk Hogan, it feels like, okay, this guy's got my back. I can count on him. Absolutely. And I had made a note here to make sure to mention, I'm sure this episode is killing our producer, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> Non-wrestling fan. It's all right. Uh, there was a great series of matches with the Valiant Brothers. Jimmy and Jerry and Jimmy Johnny. Jimmy and Johnny. Okay. And the great Chief J Strongbow. Now, he really wasn't a good worker, but the people bought him. I mm -hmm. He just, he had it too. Yeah. And something happened. Of course, it was on TV where the, he was there, where he was in a match with Strongbow and somebody. And the Valiant Brothers made a sneak attack and they ripped Chief J Strongbow's headdress up. Mm. And for those who don't know, Chief J. Strongbow's name was Joe Scarpa. Right. He was a nice Italian kid from somewhere. Not to be confused with Wahoo McDaniel, who right. was an actual Native American. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. But he took the Indian persona. And uh, so Bruno came to his aid. And they had these incredible matches at the Garden with the Valiant Brothers against uh, Bruno and Chief J. Strongbow. Right in that 73, 74, 75 period, uh, eventually Bruno lost to Billy Graham mm -hmm. and he wanted to rest. Yeah. He really wanted to rest and he'd made, you know, he, he didn't have any bad habits mm -hmm. uh, and they, they brought him back for the famous feud with Larry, you know, there was Larry Zabisco who was around for five, four, five, six years. He, they always build him as Bruno's protege, but he was always in the middle of the card, not really even in the upper card. And uh, he and Bruno were going to have a, sci a scientific... <laughs> right. do, you, do you use that term? I do, and I've used it in the it Pure Tournament. for the Pure, pure Tournament. Yeah, absolutely. A scientific match is when it would just be holds and, and not really too much striking, no no punches. Kind of a pure match, if you're familiar with the Pure style. Right, so they had a scientific exhibition on TV. And uh, it went bad, and Zabisco took advantage of Bruno. Uh, there was blood on TV. This was shocking. Mm. And uh, this led to the biggest gate 
the biggest attendance of New York City wrestling, except for WrestleMania, at Giant Stadium eclipsed it, of course. Mm -hmm. But for this, in 1980, I remember dragging my, like AJ, I would have dragged you if you, you know, because I was dragging my friends that didn't really care about wrestling. But everybody knew Bruno. Yeah. Everyone knew Bruno. Or one of my friends, like Gary Finnell, was like, oh, I haven't watched wrestling in 10 years, but I'll go. Right. And it was Bruno and Larry Zabisco at Shea Stadium. Yeah. And we went. And uh, there's... Also on YouTube, I don't know if it's on the network, there's alternate commentary with Mick Foley. You ever hear this? I did. It's Mick Foley and Taz? It's funny. Yeah. Because the ring was out by second base. There were no <laughs> ringside seats. And there are these, it was hot. It was a hot July or August yeah. night. And there's these oddball characters, like maybe someone <laughs> on the road, like the grounds crew at Shea right. Stadium. And they're there without a shirt on. And Mick, and Mick Foley says, geez, geez, it looks like the cast of Grapes of Red. <laughs> <laughs> they started to surround the ring. So we went out to Shea. Well, Bruno got his revenge. Do you know what other match was on that card? I know a couple. And there's a, a fun story with Antonio Noki and Larry Sharp. Okay. Larry Sharp had to pick him up at the airport and there's some miscommunication. That's a good story. That's on YouTube. Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant. That's exactly right. That's yeah. what I had written down. Yeah. And Andre beat Hulk Hogan. This is before Hulk Hogan was Hulk Hogan. But uh, amazingly, he's in the red and yellow, which he didn't quite wear at that time. So it's weird when you watch that match. He looks a little I'm, younger, but he's in his kind of more Well, he was a, he was a villain. Right. And he was managed by Freddie Blassie, I yeah, believe. Yeah, he was. But yeah, that was that was cool. Um some of the other match dad the card was uh it had some classic preliminary matches and then they brought in a few uh like Anoki. Mm -hmm. But they drew legitimately close to 40,000 people. Yeah. And uh, Ticket, that was... Tickets weren't cheap either. <laughs> Maybe $10, $12 for just... Uh, yeah. Yeah, but they... It, it was good. They, well, I went to the previous Shea Stadium card, which was in 71. They tried to do Bruno against Pedro. Oh. And it was a, a baby face on baby face match. And uh, it was a rainy night in late yeah. September. M me and my cousin Mike G went, and uh, it just didn't work. And they only they could have held it in the garden, uh, maybe if it wasn't raining. Mm -hmm. uh, they drew like twenty thousand people, mm -hmm. but uh, the next time they drew double. And then pretty much Bruno was uh, was out. Yeah, he wrestled very sporadically in the eighties. But I did get to see in person his last match at Madison Square Garden. Wow. And why they even did this match, I don't know. Uh, some of our East Coast true historians might know, but it was July 12th, 1986. It was a steel cage match. And who do you think Bruno's partner was? I think I know this match. I think, was it him and Tito versus Randy Savage and Adrian Adonis? Bingo. Yeah, this is a good match. This is a very good you match. You must have been looking at my notes. No, no. I, this is a very, very good match. It it was on the Steel Cage uh, VHS right. growing up. Yeah. And that was Bruno's last time at Madison Square Garden. And it was his last time in New York City until, and he wasn't, oh, wait. I had a, I got to meet Bruno. We're going to get to ring. I was going to say that was his, my great, I was going on this crescendo. It was his last time in New York City until 2006 when he came in for Ring of Honor. Mm -hmm. um, might he have been at a card show yeah, somewhere? He did the night, the fan appreciation. Uh, John Arezzi in Pro, yes, 90, 1990 yes. had him in. But it wasn't over. It wasn't like uh, we're uh, um, Steve Carlton or Steve Garvey was like at every big card show. Right. Um, no disrespect to those guys, but if they were looking to do it. Bruno wasn't. Right. And he, the famous story that John Arezzi tells is Bruno refused money for his autograph at that show. Good for him. Ric Flair. And, and they were reasonable prices. He, he, John Arezzi shared the ad recently. It was like six to ten dollars and it was rick flair it was sting buddy you know, rogers buddy rogers and the famous picture of buddy and, and bruno um 
But yeah, Bruno was zero. Bruno was zero dollars. Well, that's the kind of man he was. Mm -hmm. So, but I got to meet him and say hello to him when I was in my post ticket scalping days and I was starting to get my stuff together and I was uh, running around doing deliveries for union tickets on 59th Street, right across from Central Park between 5th and 6th Avenue, right past the Plaza Hotel and before the St. Moritz Hotel, Mickey Mantle had a bar and restaurant. Hmm. It was uh, in the eighties, into well into the night. Well, he passed away in you know ninety five. Yeah, it was there for many years. So I would go buy it, and uh, I went in there one time. I went in there a few times. I'll get a beer. And one time, Mickey Mantle was there. Hmm. I couldn't get to talk to him. He was sitting in the back, but. Uh, one of the FAN, uh, WFAN was the all sports station. Mm-hmm. And they used to do uh, maybe once a week, they would do uh, something live from Mickey Mantles. Mm. And I'm going by Mickey Mantles. I wasn't planning to stop in. And I see on the, uh, they had a chalk board in the window. Uh, today, meet Bruno San Martino, 4 p.m. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the Mickey Mantle's is a legit place. Uh, so I went in and it, it, it was it was like 2.30. I'm like, oh, I got to run around with these envelopes. Uh, but Bruno was there. There were, I, I don't know how he filtered, how a wrestling thing filtered into WFAN New York at the time, but it did. And it was at the time... Bruno had refed for WCW. Right, 92. That was no. Halloween Havoc. Oh, he did. He did, 80, he did 89. Halloween Havoc 89. Right. He came back in 92. So yeah. I just said, I I just want to say hello. I was, was such a fan. He was so nice. And then I asked him about the Halloween Havoc thing. And he's like, ah. <laughs> he goes, it is uh, no good. He goes, I'm a whatever. I, I don't I care exactly. But he, he, he broke kayfabe. <laughs> you know, he wasn't going to say this was great wrestling. Yeah. Because it wasn't. For his, for his M- taste. Muda had to put the fire, the cage lid on fire. Muda put right. it out with his mitts. So naturally, he wouldn't like <laughs> right. that. Right. And that uh, unplanned, thank God for Muda, the cage would have been. So that'll bring us up to Ring of Honor and 2006. Mm-hmm. Um, we were bringing in these legends, Dusty Rhodes, Ricky Steamboat, Mick Foley, who will have to do a little episode on at some point. All of them will have to do an episode on. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, we had done the, the Samoa Joe Kabashi in the hotel, and we had worked our way into the Manhattan Center. Mm-hmm. And we had a relationship with Noah, and we were having uh, Brian Danielson against Kenta. Mm-hmm. And it so happened, not Comic-Con, but the new, it was, there was a, it's like a rival promotion. It still exists, like New York City Comic Convention or whatever they call themselves. That was running, and I noticed they were having wrestlers, and I noticed that Bruno was going to be there. Wow. So, did you ever hear the name Sal Carrenti? I have, yeah. He's, uh... He was he was in Ready to Rumble that movie that WCW movie wasn't he? Well, I don't know about that, but he was Bruno's agent. <laughs> okay, he was a referee and a, a, he was a wrestler and he was Bruno's contact. Okay, so we contacted him. It was I think it was four grand, but we didn't have to pay like airlines because he was going to be in New York, mm-hmm. and the four grand included we could do the uh, interview. Okay, now Carnet and Homicide were having their feud, their feud at that time right. in 2006. <laughs> and it got a little it got a little blue. Yes, <laughs> it got, a- absolutely. <laughs> so Carnet was going to be in New York City, which he hated. Yeah. But yet he would, he says he hates it, <laughs> but he'd love to go to see, him and Stacy would love to go to see a Broadway show. Sure. Ooh, Young Frankenstein. Yeah. Ooh, the producers. It loves Ooh, that right. kind of humor, yeah. And uh, he would love to go out. I would take him down a little Italy uh, to that restaurant, I, Angelo's, that we, we loved so much, or and other places. So once you got him to the place, <laughs> he was good. He liked to have a few drinks. So Jim was booked already. We, we, 
I'm going to book Bruno. And Gabe, Gabe Sapolsky says to me, Carrie, I know you love Bruno and he's your childhood hero. But he's, he's no one, you know, th these fans don't care about him. And, I, you know, Gabe usually was right. And Gabe certainly knew history, but he made a bad handicap of this. And I said, Gabe, we're going to be at the Manhattan Center. We're in the shadow of Madison Square Garden where he had like 150 soul. He was he was there 187 times. That's a bogus number. Right. He had probably 100 sellouts. Mm -hmm. As many as Billy Joel has more than Billy Joel has had. And uh, people are going to care. And I said, I said, Gabe, you don't think they're going to buy autographs? He goes, well, yeah, but, you know, that comic show. I go, well, you think every one of our fans is going to be at the comic show? Well, he's like, well, it's, if you want to do it, it's, it's fine. So he was booked. Well, Gabe, in, in the end, was happy to have him because I'll, I'll tell you, I think you've probably, have you ever seen that? The scene? Yeah. So um, first of all, the shoot interview. Um, we were, I was at Sheraton and I rented an extra room and it was Jim Carnett. It was raining out mm. and he was staying. I got him a room at like, uh, I might've been the Waldorf. Like I had points. Okay. So him and Stacy were high on the hog <laughs> <laughs> at the Waldorf on 48th and Park. Nice. They, they, but he, he had, a, he couldn't get a cab. You know how it's like to get a cab in the city. Oh, especially up there. This is pre-Uber, folks. Yeah, especially up there. I mean, that's a prime tourist destination. Right. So everybody's looking for a cab. And when it's raining. Oh, yep. It's impossible. What I learned to do, by the way, is you go up to a uh, a doorman of a hotel, mm -hmm. and there was an art, there was an article in the New York Times many years ago called "The Magic of the Twenty Dollar Bill." Probably now it's the magic of the hundred dollar bill, <laughs> but you know you give the doorman the doorman will have a line of people mm -hmm. waiting for a cab. Go to the doorman here, and to me, I got you know, he's like. Right this way, sir. The next cab, you know, pulls up in front of the uh, wherever you're at. Yeah. It's got to be a good hotel. But so Jim had a walk. Bruno was flying in from Pittsburgh. No, he was. Is he in? Yeah, we did the interview the day before the comic show. Mm -hmm. the comic show and the Ring of Honor show were the same day. So he was coming in on Friday. Sal Carrenti was responsible for picking him up. And remember, Sal Carrenti told me, "I meet him in Newark Airport." Bruno don't Bruno don't carry a cell phone. He, he won't get a cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> he just won't get a cell phone. So he has to come out and hope that he's, you know, that he's yeah. there. <laughs> they were there. They drove in. The, let's just say it was two in the afternoon on Friday. Jim was so prepared with these questions. And it, the, the little history I gave, mm -hmm. is, you know, please watch the... Uh, Bruno Jim Carnett shoot interview from 2006. Uh, Bruno will not break kayfabe, and Jim knew it, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just great. Um, it was so exciting, um, and I get it. That was when I really got to meet Bruno. Yeah, what and, was it like being in the same room as your childhood hero and knowing that he was accessible as he was? Well, he was a nice he, he was a nice man. So you know what I did? To, I swear to God, this is true. You know what I did to break the ice? So he knew I was a real fan, and he knew that I knew history. Yeah. You know, when he got in a room and Jim wasn't there yet, Jim was okay. like 10, 15 minutes late. And I said, you know, Bruno, my parents are old Nurkers, mm -hmm. and they used to know Willie Gilsenberg. <laughs> and he says, looks at me, he goes, oh, that's right. Willie Gilsenberg, as if he hadn't thought of <laughs> Willie Gilsenberg in 30 years. Right. So, yeah, it was cool. He was a gentleman. He carried himself well. And Gary Juster was good friends with Bruno. Mm -hmm. he just, I, on, on the ROH Strong podcast, Gary talks about Bruno. And, you know, when he died, uh, what, six, five, six years ago? Yeah. You never thought this. What chance do I have? Right. This guy was clean as a whistle. He might he might have a couple of wines once in a while at, at, with a nice dinner. Mm -hmm. That was it. Yeah. And uh, he was working out to the day he 
he was he was jacked for 80 some years right, old he, right. was, he was jacked he was I met him in 1998. It was the firmest handshake I'd ever received in my Where life was that to at? this day. At Bud Carson's store. It was the first autograph signing Bud ever had. Did he get a good turnout? It was out the door. It was out the door and almost around the block. And Bruno waited for me because I had been such a regular customer at Bud Carson's store. <laughs> I had paid ahead. And my mom said, hey, Ian's got a basketball game. And Bruno's coming in at, let's say, 2 Ian's game's at, at 2.30. He's not going to be able to make it. And Bud said, well, we'll take care of it. We'll get the stuff autographed. My mom had a cell phone, and Bud said, Bud called her and said, hey, don't Bruno's Bruno's hanging around. Bring Ian down. And he waited and maybe an extra hour. To That's meet, the kind of man he was. Yeah, to meet a 10-year-old kid, 11-year-old kid. It's incredible. That's so nice. Yeah. <laughs> so we did the shoot interview. I, it, was, it was just awesome to be there. Uh, just, you know, um, there's not a lot of times I get, uh, you know, awestruck. Like we talked about Nicolas Cage. It was like, mm. right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, that was somebody who takes your breath away. Yeah. You, you know, even though he's he was 25 years past <clears throat> past his prime, it didn't matter. He was a living legend. So <clears throat> the next day was the ROH show. And we went to the comic. I, I had an idea. Let's get a table at the comic book convention thing. Mm -hmm. We could try to, we still had tickets on sale. Mm -hmm. uh, we could sell Ring of Honor DVDs. They had like five or six wrestlers. They had Bruno, Lou Albano was there. No. Probably the perennial Greg Valentine. Sure. <laughs> and I don't remember who else, but... Uh, I remember we took it at the comic show. The table might have cost us two hundred. Mm -hmm. We took in like seven or eight hundred dollars. Wow, that was good. Yeah, and uh, we packed up early and went over to the Manhattan Center. Mm -hmm. So the, the, it was a that was Danielson against Kenta, mm -hmm. and Gabe was going to have Bruno come out. I believe after the first match was hot. Mm. And uh, it was it was a hot opener and it was a fairly long opener, long enough that everyone's in the building. And, or it might have been the third after the second match. But the spot was Bruno comes out <clears throat> to no music because he had no music. Right. And I, I believe <clears throat> I'll have to look back. But, you know, uh, maybe Bobby Cruz uh, introduced him. Mm -hmm. Probably did. And Bruno came out and it was similar to what you were talking about with Kabashi's reaction. Yeah. Bruno was not expecting anyone to, you know, he's looking at the, he's, he's in the ring. It's a total standing ovation for long standing ovation where Gabe was dead wrong, where mm. everyone cared about him. Yeah. And Bruno's opening comment was, and I think we've said this on the podcast before, but that's OK. Bruno's opening comment was, you know, thank you. And I can't believe it. You know, I I, I haven't wrestled in, in since 87. He goes, he thought for a second, he goes, a lot of you guys weren't even born yet or you're <laughs> just babies. Right. I didn't think anyone would know me. Yeah. <laughs> and the crowd roared again. And uh, to, to add to the uh, this is a correct way to use pomp and pageantry when bruno came out and the ovation was going on the whole ring of honor locker room came out and surrounded the ring baby faces and heels yeah and uh it was like you know it was like a major a major ovation uh i watched during earlier in the pandemic i watched and i think i mentioned it to you uh, 1969 Mickey Mantle Day at Yankee Stadium. He'd retired in 68. Mm -hmm. And what was famous about that was there was a nine minute standing ovation wow. for Mickey Mantle where he just couldn't even get to where like everyone's on the field. They introduce Yogi. They yeah. introduce Whitey Ford, Joe DiMaggio, Joe Pepitone, this one, <laughs> that one. And when Mantle came out, it was they they it was nine minutes. Well, the Bruno one was maybe three minutes, but mm -hmm. it was very impressive. And he didn't say much and thank everybody and da, 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 da. And Gabe was smart. I hate to give him so much credit, but credit <laughs> where it's due, because as the wrestlers were leaving the ring, mm -hmm. 
after Bruno departed, Morishima right. and Samoa Joe bumped into each other yeah. physically. And that was the first time they didn't, you know, it was just like a, a, a they actually physically wasn't like, you know, you're trying. They just sort of bumped into each other and they just both stared off real quick and they just went. And that was the small seeds of the Morishima Samoa Joe uh matches that went on after that yeah uh it was a wonderful time so then the intermission came mm -hmm. where bruno sells his autographs this is our chance to get the four thousand dollars back <laughs> sure. besides the dvd the shoot dvd but you have to be thrilled at this point with the reaction oh, and, yeah. and just the little you know you're you're right there's got to be some pride <laughs> in knowing that the fans and, would react and people were you know the, the autographs were $25. Okay. Which is, I think, a, a bargain. I, in Some people were buying two or three tickets. Yeah. Different things signed. Yeah. Well, Gabe didn't like a long intermission, which is good. But mm -hmm. that's, we were so dependent on merchandise and DVDs back in that era. Right. So the line was huge and Gabe comes out. <laughs> <laughs> he had to eat crow at that point because it's like there, there's there's 125 people still online. Yeah. He goes, Karen, we got to get the second half started. I go, well, wait a little while. Yeah. You know, come on. Well, Bruno was signing. Uh, and guess what? The people, when the lights went back out and there may have been 20 or 30 people still online, mm -hmm. nobody got off the line yeah. to go. Even if it was a fabulous match, mm -hmm. they wanted to meet Bruno. And Bruno signed, you know, he, he was great. Um, I booked him again when we had WrestleMania weekend in Detroit. Okay. Uh, that was a vanity move by me. He mm. didn't mean that much uh, in Detroit, but people still came. Sure. You know, it, it wasn't, it was, it, but what was cool about that one, I think that was 2007 mm -hmm. or uh, seven or eight. M myself, Nigel, Larry Sweeney and Delirious were sitting in the back with just wooden chairs in this. Uh, it was the Detroit. It was where they had held the fair in Detroit, similar to the Ag Hall, mm -hmm. a Detroit version of Ag Hall. And the fair is not on. And it's this tin tin shack, but it was good for the purpose. And it was like about his card was at say, eight o'clock and it was seven o'clock and Bruno was back there. And I clearly remember Sweeney, Nigel and Delirious, myself, probably a couple other guys were just sitting around and just asking, just listening. And I didn't want, no one wanted to say the wrong thing because mm -hmm. he wouldn't break, you know, he just wouldn't break kayfabe. And I had to ask him about the original Sheik. Oh, in Detroit. Yeah. Now the original Sheik, we used to, he used to throw fire yeah. and he had his, his gimmick was the pencil. He would use a pencil and, and, and Bruno had him, you know, Bruno did programs with him in Boston hmm. and he had him at the garden once, but there was too much heat. It, literally the, the fans were, were in such a frenzy. They didn't bring him back to New York. Wow. But uh, so Bruno, when, when I brought up the chic, Bruno says to all of us, Oh, you know, that stuff with the pencil. Uh, no, that's not, that's not pro wrestling. <laughs> so he, he, he was protective of the business, yeah. even though we were in the business. Right. And we were literally behind the curtain. He did not want to pull the curtain door open. And uh, did he have any favorites? I mean, I, Brian Danielson is the consummate wrestlers wrestler. Samoa Joe and Morishima remind me. And, and some of the fans listening to this might take this the wrong way, but. 1970s Nikolai Volkov, a huge guy that could move, that could do power moves, that could, that could talk. Um, you know, just these big intimidating guys. Killer Kowalski, same thing. I, did he did he like what he saw when he was at the shows? Honestly, uh, oh, because my first instinct would be that he he might not. Because he didn't. Uh, I don't think he paid that much attention to it, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, uh, Jeff Schwartz and Shane Hagedorn will know this better than I did, but I I believe there was a spot mm -hmm. where he hit, where he hit Sweeney okay. in Detroit, and he didn't want to do it. Mm. He didn't want to do it, 
you know, and uh, it might have happened. It might not have happened. And those guys <laughs> left to tell us, you know, sure. once again, it's from a promoter's viewpoint. I might not have been watching, but I believe they wanted to. Sweeney wanted to do it. That's oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Can you and, imagine? And, like, we talked about Larry Sweeney. I think that's what happened. Yeah. It's incredible. We, Ric Flair, Bruno left us way too soon, Larry Sweeney. And yet, I mean, that shows you the talent. He, he just shined right through and was able to, to be involved with these guys. Yes. And, and Bruno's like, come on. You're going to have a 70-year-old guy hitting a 20, 20, 23? You know, he said it politely. I think we demurred from that uh, yeah. participation. And um, that was my experience with Bruno San Martino. He, he was such a nice man. Uh, and Gary, Gary Juster expressed, you know, when he passed away, uh, Gary would call him like, once a month or every mm. other month. And when he was in Pittsburgh mm. and Ring of Honor started going to Pittsburgh. Yeah. I think, didn't Bruno come to a Ring of Honor show in Pittsburgh one time? It was before before I was full time, yeah. I wasn't yeah. there either. Yeah. He, he, stayed, he came by. I think Ring of Honor started coming to Pittsburgh in 2014 officially. And that's, 2014 was the only year I wasn't there. So that would have to be the, yeah. have to been the date. Yeah. So uh, that's our story of... Uh, my story of uh, Bruno, you know, the, the true living legend. Sure. And uh, he is. He's just an amazing presence, uh, amazing wrestler. I think even if you are into the, quote, Ring of Honor style, and what I mean by that is, you know, I think a Roderick Strong or I think a Danielson or Loki or Daniels or Adam Cole or the Briscoes, I, I think you like Bruno. There's something magnetic there, even if you like sort of the different flavors of ice cream. Yes, and uh, those of you who uh, are listening to this that are wrestling fans and you haven't really checked out Bruno, please check him out. I mean, yeah. uh, just just remember, you know, things evolve. Uh, based on based on the Broadway show the other company did. <laughs> did you see that? No. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I based did. on yeah, that. I liked it. it yeah, was fun. yeah, it was fun. Absolutely. Yeah. So based on everyone's got different flavors. So if you can enjoy that, mm -hmm. you certainly could go back to, to uh, Bruno San Martino when things were in a simpler, slower time. And uh, but yet the energy was better than ever. Yeah. But, you know, it just was it was special. So um, I think we did okay with this. Yeah, this was a fun one. I, I got a couple rapid fire questions sure. to, to wrap it up. You, you mentioned Bruno came in because you saw it on a Comic-Con. Had, had you had, once you started promoting, and we talked about only a few shows in, in your tenure Ring of Honor really went into the, into the black rather than the red. Was there ever a goal to bring in, was that one of your starting goals to bring in Legends or did that just happen organically? I wanted to bring in legends. We had a, there was a, early on, we were in Philly and tickets weren't selling. And um, I said, why don't we, you know, it like, Gabe was like, well, we could get Dusty Rhodes. It would be like $500 in a flight. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, get them. Yeah. And I think that started the ball rolling. Okay. And then the Coronets came. Yeah. And along with him, of course, the Midnight Express mm -hmm. and uh, Ricky Steamboat. You know, we and and once the ball was rolling, we're in Ohio, and we've got Steamboat and Foley had a program, so to speak, not against each other, but they were. Uh, it was like pure wrestling against not hardcore, but just Foley. Foley. Yeah, Foley side of the fence, and. There they are in the back of the Dayton or the, the, the Dayton Fairgrounds. A real <laughs> ma makes the uh, <laughs> makes the Newark Armory with spaghetti <laughs> flying off the top it look like a fi the <laughs> finest establishment in the world. This Dayton place is disgusting. I made my main show debut in at that very building. Right. Yeah. <laughs> God forbid you have to really go to the bathroom, and you know uh, what I'm talking about. Bobby Cruz pooped his pants at the Dayton at that building. Because he couldn't, it's, you can't find it. It's horrible. You can't find it. Was it was horrible. There was like one toilet in the men's room and, uh, ugh. You can't get to it. But, um, Sorry, yeah, Bobby. So, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't listen anyway. Nah. <laughs> so, but Gabe says to me, like, Steamboat and Foley are talking to each other. 
just hanging out and yeah. he was like look look we got steam yeah. <laughs> so yeah it, it was it was really cool having all these legends and then bringing in jj dillon then mm -hmm. bringing in bill watts bushwhacker luke uh i'm leaving out a lot of names but uh, it was and once again it's something that as the uh doors open to fans again mm -hmm. i hope ring of honor uh resurrects that it's nice to recognize history and it's neat. Oh, and, and of course, uh, Terry Funk. Terry we Funk. had oh, that yeah. was great. Yeah, yeah, Terry that Funk. That was great. Because uh, he was involved in the match, the right. special referee. Yeah, he was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I got him tickets for. Uh, I got him ticket. Him and his wife, mm. his his dear wife that she passed away recently. Yeah, yeah. Um, I forget her first name. Vicky. No, regardless, nice lady, and they wanted to see Jersey Boys. You know, they were they were they were cool enough that they knew Jersey Boys was on Broadway and they'd heard about Jersey Boys. Yeah. And even though this is a brawling Amarillo, Texas <laughs> cowboy, they knew the, they loved the Four Seasons. Yeah. And they knew good music. Yeah. And they, they're kind of rock and roll and they wanted to go to Jersey Boys. And I hooked them up with third row seats to, wow. to Jersey Boys. And um, <laughs> Terry Funk. Uh, was so appreciative, and is that match on, on Ring of Honor? Because he drags Todd Sinclair out of the ring. <laughs> I don't think it's been uploaded yet. I could be wrong. I haven't seen it, but we are doing fifty a week, so it's going to be up there eventually. Everything's digitized. Yeah. So um, th there's a lack of. There's not as many uh, legends around anymore. So yeah. whatever legends are around, we should bring them in. Sure. That's my uh, feeling about that. And for for a minute, you know, Delirious, you know, not to pull the curtain back too much, was was using some of the legends. Bushwhacker Luke came in a couple times, uh, you know, while, while Delirious was the executive producer. And uh, we had Jerry Lynn come back after yeah. he was the champion, after he retired, come back a few times. And it's great. It really adds... You know, an extra piece for the fans and even even small things. You know, we had Tommy Dreamer come through, who at this point is a 35 year veteran. Right. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, why not bring Bret Hart back? Good people aren't don't want to get a Bret Hart autograph or right. something. It, you know, so whomever. Uh, but I'm glad that we were able to do that. Mm. And uh, my favorite and it always will be was being able to bring Bruno and tell Gabe, see, see <laughs> no, he knew, he knew. Well, were you more nervous to meet Bruno or Ian Anderson? They're both uh, held in very high esteem. I'd say 1A and 1B if I know you as uh, well as I think I do. Probably Bruno. Okay. Yeah, you know, uh, I met Ian uh, over the years, like for a, a, a second, a few times in the 70s. One time backstage, like where, where the band came in, mm -hmm. New Haven Coliseum. Uh, this is not cocaine driven. Sure. This is like 75. And uh, I said, seeing him so much that getting to meet him. Um, and then he blew me off in the bar that time. Uh, but yeah, Bruno was special. No doubt about it. Yeah. And was there any any regret that you didn't try and bring him in more? It was one shot in New York, and that was it. Yeah. You know, maybe it would have worked in Philly. Yeah. Maybe it would have worked in Boston. Right. But yeah, he didn't really want to leave the house that often. Yeah. I don't blame him. He didn't want to leave. <laughs> I don't blame him either. Yeah. Lived a, lived a great life. Was a great role model. Again, I think that had a lot to do with it, too. You know, he said what he said, what he meant, and meant what he said. And no drugs, no, hardly any alcohol, and... Married one woman his whole life. Incredible. Yeah. Just uh, just a real inspiration and help help Larry Zabisco get in it. That that story is led to be true of uh, Larry Zabisco poking around his yard and one day Bruno caught him and. <laughs> yeah, and you know, remember in the eighties he was the uh, color commentator. Yeah. But he didn't like a lot of things that were going on. Right. And there was so many. Look, there were drugs around in Bruno's era too. Right. But it wasn't rampant yeah uh, as it was you know in the the way it turned in the 80s so he was a man of principle and old school and uh uh adhered it adhered 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 yeah adhered, to his yeah. own values <laughs> and, and bided by the code of honor there you go <laughs> so 
Yeah, the uh, geez, from Abruzzi, right? Abruzzi, Italy. Yes, that's uh, Bruno San Martino, Bruno Azuno for sure. And uh, Carrie, this has been a this has been a fun walk back through memory lane. Yeah, I was gonna. We're, we don't have time, but uh, I guess this this touted this this trumped. Ooh, I hate that word. <laughs> this, this this overtook me. I had uh, on on uh, as a plan B here doing the uh, the the. Times Square drug tour. Oh, well, that's got to be its own. And a Times Square sex tour. That's got to be. A New York City sex tour of the of the 80s. Yeah. So that's got to be like a three parter. I mean, that's I mean, that's like it's like season three premiere level care. You're, you can't. Just, I mean, Bruno's big enough. You can't just drop in your you're dropping your A material. You can't just sneak it in on the end of the Bruno episode. Right. Uh, I didn't know. Uh, how long did we go here? Yeah, we're about an hour and ten minutes. It's yeah. probably a good time to to t- land yeah, the plane. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're, we're gonna uh, go home. But uh, yeah, I, I had another story. You know, I my, my I got I accomplished my goal, which was hopefully to get Ian to laugh. <laughs> Like, like last time, and I think this this story with my parents and the shoe store and the shoes and all that that that, that was I didn't know I was going to go there. Yeah, but I had this I had it in my pocket, and I told this story, and I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I'll give you a teaser. And I used to tell the Briscoes, our good friends Mark and Jay, Ring of Honor legends. I used to tell the Briscoes, the great story. I would tell them, I'd come up to them, I'd go up to Mark and go, hey, I think FFL is coming tonight. We'd be in New York. Goes, Ooh, FFL. <laughs> and, and Jay was saying, boss man, who's, who's FFL? I, go, I told you about FFL. Radio John used to hang out. We used to, used to stay with her occasionally. And Jay would be, you know, Jay would be like, hmm. I don't recollect. <laughs> and Mark Frisk goes like, ooh, come on, come on, boss. Tell, th- th- Carrie, come on, th- tell FFL. I go, I've told you about fat farting Louise. <laughs> and, and I hadn't, I hadn't. But Mark Frisk would be like, Oh yeah, <laughs> that part, Louise, Carrie. It's like, like as if it was around the uh, Christmas. Thing. Can you, Carrie, the boss? Can you tell us that story again? And I'm sure. So maybe we'll dispense the strange tale of FFL and Radio John next week. It's right up there with Frosty Freeze and Double O. <laughs> well, I look forward to it. And next week, it's critical. Vote. Oh, Lord. Get, get out and vote. And we, on that night, will be recording this. And uh, just get out and vote. Do the thing. At that press time, 69 million votes. That is the sex number, but that's also the real number. That's the number of people that, that have voted. So we want that number to did go higher and higher. Did that number come up during your sex educating? I sure did. Absolutely. That's a that's a whole different <laughs> that's a whole different podcast. That's another episode. Yeah, it's another episode. Maybe we can get into that. But uh, but yeah, get out and vote. Uh, watch the peer tournament. You can watch the peer tournament on Monday. Vote on Tuesday, and hopefully we'll have a great week. Yeah, have a please go out and vote. I. I Spilled the beans last week. This is the first time I voted since 2020. Since, excuse me, since 2000. Uh, so I'm guilty for uh, what's going on now because I didn't put in my uh, vote in 2016. So whoever you want to vote for, just go vote. Yeah. And uh, we'll be back at you. Please subscribe to Last Stop Penn Station. Uh, go on Pro Wrestling Tees and buy a T-shirt. We're waiting for someone to give us either bad reviews or good reviews. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're, we're hanging tough. And uh, I want to thank uh, AJ from Bissan Creative and uh, our buddy Eric from Discover Pro Wrestling who helps us. And uh, Ian's the man. Ah, appreciate and we, it, Thank Carrie. you. <laughs> and we hail you, Carrie. And this has been another great episode of Last Stop Penn Station. Thanks for joining us this week. Join us again next week when we're going to be talking about FFL, apparently. (laughs) So, so long for now, and we'll catch you on the flip side. We hail you 
for listening to Last Stop Penn Station podcast. Rate, review, like, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or at laststoppennstation.com.